Well, welcome everyone. We're officially starting the program that is a special edition of the Columbus Museum of Art Art Book Club. And we're very excited to have an author speaking with us today, uh, Stephanie Story, who is going to be talking about her new novel, Raphael Painter in Rome. This is part of uh, Stephanie's nationwide book tour uh, for this novel that is published by Arcade Publishing is available for purchase in the museum store, either online or if you come into the shop. And Stephanie's uh, story is an art historical novelist. This is her second book. Some of you may have participated in or heard the first program that was done with uh, Stephanie uh, through the museum's art book club that focused on her novel, Oil and Marble, a novel of Leonardo and Michelangelo, a book that was published in 2016. But uh, this book, uh, published this very year, 2020, uh, was published in uh, conjunction with the 500th anniversary of the death of Raphael, the great Renaissance painter. And I should mention that you might uh, want to uh, keep in mind, uh, it won't happen for a couple years yet, but a special exhibition is going to be mounted at the Columbus Museum in the year 2022 called Raphael, The Power of Renaissance Images, the Dresden Tapestries and Their Impact. And this will consist of six large, very large tapestries from the Dresden Museum, the Old Master Picture Gallery in Dresden, that will be accompanied by other related works of art uh, opening in Columbus on July 15, 2022. These works, uh, these tapestries based directly on large paintings or the so-called uh, Vatican cartoons by Raphael. Well, um, one final note. If you have questions that you'd like Stephanie to answer, or if you're experiencing technical difficulties, if you have trouble hearing or seeing, if your images are too small, if you can't hear the audio feed, um, you can enter your questions in a bubble or in a um, uh, through the function called chat that is um, identified with a little icon that looks like a cartoon bubble. And if you uh, enter your uh, questions in text form and click send, we will be able to uh, read your questions and either help you or uh, Stephanie can answer your questions. So without further ado, I will turn over the screen, turn over this session to Stephanie's story. And Stephanie, take it away. Thank you so much, David, and thank you everybody for joining me on this Sunday afternoon to talk a little art and get distracted from our crazy world and disappear into the Renaissance for a while. As David said, if while I'm talking you have questions, please do drop them in the chat so that I know they're coming up and I know people have questions. I'm going to give you like a little 20 minute sort of basically why I wrote this book and how it came to be the book that it actually is. I'm going to do a little reading too. Um, and then when that's over, we'll answer questions. I will answer as many of them as I possibly can. And we will uh, continue on about our day. But thank you for joining me. Um, I am actually uh, going to start this particular show and I will tell you why afterwards. I'm going to let Raphael kick this one off. So I'm going to start by reading the prologue, which is set in Rome, March 1520. Why does Michelangelo always get to be the hero? A struggling sculptor, not trained in the art of fresco, forced by a temperamental pope to abandon his precious marble and paint a wretched ceiling, overcomes agony and obstacles to create a divine masterpiece. Si certo, you're moved by the story. I'm moved by it. But you don't honestly believe that he painted that ceiling while lying on his back, do you? How would he crawl in and out, his body only an arm length from the ceiling without smearing the paint all the time. And how would he have moved, wriggled about on his shoulder blades and hindquarters? I mean, perhaps once or twice 
when he was up against a particularly steep curve of a spandrel. He had no choice but to lie on his back for a moment or two, but let's bury the myth right now. Michelangelo painted like the rest of us, standing up. Don't believe me. Look at his own drawings. He sketched himself painting that ceiling, head tilted back, arms stretching overhead, standing on his feet. So no, Michelangelo was not some subjugated hero forced to lie on his back by an intransigent pope. I'm not angry at him for the story. I only wish I'd thought of it. Tell me, per favore, that you don't believe that he hates to paint? Yes, he repeats the lie oft as the Nicene Creed, but that doesn't make it true. During the years when he was painting the Sistine, not carving any marble at all, he still insisted on signing all of his letters. Michelangelo, sculptor in Rome, as though he hates to paint so much that he's incapable of calling himself a painter. But if you, ever walked into the Sistine on a quiet Tuesday morning and looked up at those colors. Santa Madonna, those colors. Were you moved to tears too? Now tell me that he could have painted such a thing while hating it. I mean, is that what you tell your children? Find something you hate, force yourself to do it, and echo a masterpiece. I know what people say about me. They say that Raphael Santi of Urbino is the ideal courtier. Polite, generous, humble. They say I was born with such happy countenance that nothing ruffles me. They say my good looks reflect the beauty on the inside. They say my talent comes easily. They say everything comes easily. But don't strip me of my humanity because I'm good at playing a part. You do it too, I'll wager. Put on a smile sometimes, even when you're feeling down. So don't deny me those same basic human talents. In real life, no one could be as generous and loyal and charming as I pretend to be. No one. You imagine me, if you imagine me at all, the way he describes me, don't you? Standing in the background, easy to forget, an easy rival to vanquish. And when I look back on those years, I picture the events the way he tells them to. Him in the center, me, in the corner. Oh, Maria Virgine, that's what I do, isn't it? All he does is make himself the hero of his own story. Can I blame him for that? But why do I insist on making him the hero of mine? How can I expect anyone else to say I'm the greatest painter in history if I can't say so myself? So is there a version where I get to be the hero? Or does he end the victor every time? That is the prologue to my new novel, Raphael Painter in Rome. Um, I started out reading that prologue today because frankly, I did not know where to start with the book club at the Columbus Museum of Art because you're a great art museum. So I was like, do these people know all of Raphael's art? Do they not? Are they more interested in old Renaissance painters or his influence on the modernists? I don't know, have they read the book? Did they not finish it? You people are daunting to me. So I didn't know where to start. And so as I was worried about how to give this presentation today, it reminded me of how much I struggled with finding the voice and the path for this novel to begin with. When I finished writing my debut novel, Oil and Marble, many of you have read it because I did the book club here uh, last year. 
Um, if For those of you who haven't read it, though, it's about the rivalry between Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, a great rivalry that spawned two of the greatest works in all of Western history, the Mona Lisa and the David. And when I finished writing this book, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? The next book I'm going to write, it's going to be about the next great period in Michelangelo's life. I'm going to write about Michelangelo painting the Sistine ceiling. This is the period that I'm obsessed with. This is what I want to write about. And yes, at the end of Oil of Marble, I intentionally have Raphael show up. That's not really a spoiler if you haven't read it. It's not really that important. But he does show up at the end of this book. Because I knew he was Michelangelo's great rival during the Sistine ceiling years. However, I thought this book, uh, I thought this book, Raphael, was going to look a lot like Oil of Marble. I thought it was gonna bounce back and forth between Michelangelo and Raphael as they went head to head in the halls of the Vatican. That's how I pictured this second book going. But when I started working on this second book, I realized that I, started, I really struggled because there were other, we already know so much about Michelangelo's time up the Sistine ceiling. There have already been so many versions. Hold on, here's the Sistine again. But the number of versions we already have of this story is astonishing. These are just a few. You know, the iconic film, The Agony and the Ecstasy, starring, starring Charlton Heston and Rex Harrison, going head to head as, as Michelangelo and the Pope. And that's based on a portion of Irving Stone's novel by the same name, The Agony and the Ecstasy, which is a biographical novel of Michelangelo. We have books like The Sistine uh, Secrets and Michelangelo's Sistine Ceiling. And one of my personal favorites, Ross King's Michelangelo and the Pope Ceiling. This is just to name a few. So I realize as I'm trying to write this novel, I think I have something to say, new to say about this era. But man, this story has already been told. Now that did not stop me from writing multiple different versions of this book, okay? So I wrote a draft of this book that did bounce back and forth between Michelangelo and, Le and Raphael's points of view. It was okay, it was missing something. I also wrote a version just from Michelangelo's point of view, but it got very claustrophobic when him, with him stuck up the Sistine ceiling scaffolding the whole time. And then I even wrote a version where Felice Della Rovere, the illegitimate daughter of Pope Julius II, told the story and was the hero. Here she is in a detail of one of Raphael's frescoes, and here's a portrait of her done quite later. Um, so I even wrote this entire draft. Yes, people have asked me, isn't there a great book in there? Yes, Felicia Della Rovere is awesome. She plays a very big, important part of the plot in this novel. So for those of you who have read it, you now know why she's so important. I wrote a whole book about her, a draft of her. For those of you who have not read it, she's really fascinating and an awesome woman. And I loved including her in this. Uh, but I didn't want to write the whole book because what I'm most interested in is the struggle that artists go through to bring their art to life. And Felicia Della Rovere, as much as I love her, is not an artist. So someone else will have to write that particular book. I'm gonna get out of this and come back to me. Okay, so all of this writing different versions of the same freaking book over and over again took an enormous amount of time. Whenever I'm on the road, people ask me, how long did it write? Did it take to write your book? There are always lots of different answers to that. But this one, um, so I finished Oil and Marble in 2014. It took two years to get it to a publisher and get it edited and get it out into the world in 2016. But I finished it in 2014. And I started writing on book two, my Michelangelo up the Sistine book, immediately. Book two was not finished until 2019. And I'd already done all of the research because I'm obsessed with Michelangelo and have been for 20 years. So I've already read everything there is to know about him, read about all of his rivals, read about all the locations. I've been on a pilgrimage to see every Michelangelo ever on display on the entire planet, okay? The research was finished and the writing of this book still took me five years. My husband said I was in metaphorical child's pose for like three of those years, just like in a pure panic, in like a yoga, little ball of a yoga pose, desperate to figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And let me tell you, the whole time that I was struggling to figure out this new book, 
there was this voice in my head and this figure tapping on my shoulder going, hey, give it to me. Don't worry, I got this. That was, of course, the voice of Raphael. Okay, now if any, so for those of you who've read Oil and Marble, you know I am obsessed with Michelangelo. He's my guy. I love him, I adore him, I know everything there is to know about him. I'm the biggest fan you can get. For those of you who've read Oil and Marble, the biggest hit I still get on that is early in that book. I um, am not the nicest to Leonardo da Vinci. My, my relationship with Leonardo da Vinci grows over the course of that novel. I am biased for Michelangelo. And you're right to wonder how I could possibly write a book from the point of view of Michelangelo's biggest, fiercest rival of his entire career, which is not Leonardo, but is Raphael. I'll show you a couple pictures of Raphael. Hold on, this is still Felice Shea, but let's go forward. So these are two different self-portraits that Raphael made. This one's made in his early 20s. This one's made just before he dies at the age of 37. So this is approximately who Raphael is during his lifetime, or at least his version of himself. Michelangelo despises Raphael during their lifetime. Okay, Raphael's younger, more handsome, more charming, more popular. Many people said Raphael was more naturally talented. I mean, Raphael is the prodigy when he's young, while Michelangelo has to struggle to become an, a sculptor. And while Michelangelo, during the Sistine years, he's throwing planks at the Pope's head and they're cursing each other in the chapel. Raphael and that same Pope, Pope Julius II, are having dinner together. They're like hanging out. You know, Raphael's charming everybody in the place while Michelangelo is making everybody mad. Raphael is this famous ideal courtier. He's kind, generous, humble, handsome. Men want to be him and women want to bed him kind of a thing. Of course, Michelangelo is driven crazy by this guy, right? He's like the worst rival you can imagine. So how can I, an admitted, biased, loyal, Michelangelo Obsesso, write a novel from the first person of, of Raphael, first person point of view, Raphael? How can I let Michelangelo's fiercest rival, most hated rival, take over telling the story of what is arguably Michelangelo's biggest triumph? on the ceiling of, of the Sistine Chapel. You know, when you write a first person novel, uh, you can't let your narrator be hated. You can't let him be the enemy like I sort of did with, with Leonardo at the beginning of Oil and Marble. The reader is about to listen to that narrator for the entire book. They wanna be charmed by them. They wanna love your narrator. They want to want to listen to him for hours upon hours of their lives. So how was I going to get over my own biases to write this novel in the first person, uh, Raphael's point of view? First of all, it turns out that Raphael is genuinely so charming that it was not that hard. Uh, second, it helped that I have actually been a fan of Raphael's art since I was a kid. Of course, we all know his famous Pudi, right? So even when I was a child, I recognized these guys and I loved them. They're these mischievous little kids we see on coffee mugs and throw pillows and Christmas ornaments. Now, I didn't know when I was a kid that they, that they, that they actually come from the bottom of a larger altarpiece called the Sistine Madonna. Here they are. Uh, but, this, but, but I loved them. So I loved them as a kid. I always wondered about them. Another painting that I've loved since, uh, since I got my undergraduate degree in art history at Vanderbilt University was this painting, very famous, School of Athens. It is arguably the first perfect painting, perfect perspective, perfect figures, perfect colors, perfect light and dark, perfect, perfect, perfect painting. Uh, it's now, if you haven't seen it, uh, you can go to the, um, the Stanza della Segnatura in the Vatican, uh, and this is where, the, this is basically the room, it's two different pictures, here's one picture, here's one picture, of the actual physical room where this painting is held. Um, and just for kicks, just in case you wanna know, um, uh, this figure right here in the middle of, of the School of Athens is actually a contemporary uh, portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. This 
is a contemporary portrait of a guy by the name of Michelangelo that Raphael paints in this painting right here. He, he, he's right here. And then over here, uh, I, I included little close-ups of them over here on the right. And then way over here, tucked in the corner, if you see right here, if I'm moving my cursor enough, uh, that is Raphael. That's a tiny portrait of Raphael. So he literally does put Michelangelo in the center of his life and sticks himself over in the corner. Uh, so that's the School of Athens. I also adored for a long time his paintings of Madonnas. This is one of my favorites. It's held in the uh, National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Uh, he painted Madonna after Madonna after Madonna. And I was also obsessed with his portraits of a woman by the name of Margarita Ludi, the baker's daughter. She was famously Raphael's muse. She, he painted her over and over and over again. And she plays an extraordinarily prominent part of the plot of my novel as well, because she has to, right? I mean, Raphael genuinely loved and adored this woman. Uh, so she is in many of his masterpieces. Of course, the, the Triumph of Galeta. This is found in the uh, Villa uh, Farnesina in Rome. Uh, in the loggia, it's right here. That painting is physically on the wall right here. It is obviously used as the cover of my book, which makes her a very pretty cover of a book. Uh, so I love that painting as well. And uh, one of my personal favorites is the Transfiguration, which is the painting that Raphael was, was working on when he died. Uh, here it is, is in its home room in the Vatican. I saw it for the first time when I was 20. And this painting positively glows when you are in that room. Regardless of your religious beliefs, this is arguably the greatest painting of the high Italian Renaissance, which is with its balance, but with its combination of balance and chaos down below, its light and dark, its colors, its range of emotions. This is, this is arguably the greatest painting of that era. Um, oh, and then you guys have the tapestries coming. The tapestry, the cartoons for the tapestries that were intended uh, to go in the Sistine underneath Michelangelo's great masterpiece. So that would have been um, sort of the culmination of their uh, uh, rivalry if Raphael had lived to see them completed. Um, he, he finished the cartoons, he finished the designs. You guys are gonna be able to see them in Columbus. I'm gonna come up and visit when that, when that exhibit is on because I can't wait. Uh, to see them and in the way you guys are packaging them together. But so all of that art I've known about forever. So I loved him and all of that art. So that helped me find his voice. But even though I've loved and respected his art for a really long time, I'd always had a major re problem relating to his personality. I mean, he was, he was presented by my history books as perfect as his paintings. He was handsome, charming, humble, generous. And all of those things seem really great, except when they're combined in a single human being who is also outrageously talented, then it just becomes like annoying. I don't like my people to be perfect. You know, I like my people as, as messy, and as, particularly my artists you know, as messy as I am, I want a little grunge in there. And according to my history books, Raphael did not have any of that. So I wasn't upset with Michelangelo for being a bit annoyed by Raphael. I sort of agreed with him. But it was just as I was thinking that, that I um, sat down. I was actually at a coffee shop by the beach in San Diego. And I sat down and that prologue that I read to you earlier, it poured out of me. You know, why does Michelangelo always get to be the hero? You know, uh, don't strip me of, of my humanity because I'm good at playing a part. You know, uh, no one could be as generous and loyal and charming as I pretend to be, no one. And, and that Raphael in my head also sounded really modern. I mean, he didn't sound archaic. And, 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 st and stilted like the old masters. And of course he shouldn't because during his lifetime, Raphael was one of the most modern artists of his day. 
He was pushing old art into new forms. Of course he sounds modern. He sounded modern to his own ears when he spoke. So that's how he sounded in my head. He also sounded really casual when he started talking to me, as though he was sitting across a tavern table from me, telling me the story about the time that he went head to head with Michelangelo in the halls of the Vatican. And all he wanted was to tell me that no human being could ever be as perfect as one of his paintings. And that's when I realized that all of Raphael's desperate perfection in his work was covering up an enormous amount of pain. You know, Raphael was orphaned when he was a kid. His mom and his sister died when he was eight and his dad died when he was 11. So he had no immediate family. He had no one to help him along his way. Uh, he did have an uncle and his father's old assistant. Uh, that's about it. That was all he had. He was by himself. He lived a short, brilliant, and difficult life on the Italian peninsula, which was rife with all kinds of violence. There were, the French army was marching up and down, and there were military sieges and plagues, all kinds of things, right? It was, it was a difficult time to live. And on a April 6th, 1520, 500 years ago this year, Raphael died at the age of 37. Now, if you read uh, uh, Giorgio Vasari's biography of him, Giorgio Vasari is our very first art historian, right? And if you read Giorgio Vasari's bio of him, with a little bit of a shifted perspective, realizing that Raphael's pretty front was all just a front to cover up a lot of pain, you suddenly see that Vasari's not describing a, a proper courtier. He's describing what we might instead call like a modern day rock star. You know, he's having a lot of sex. He's living a bit of an indulgent life. He's enjoying himself. Uh, he's creating beautiful images and he's beloved. And if you look at Raphael's drawings, I no longer see, here I'll show you some of his drawings. This is the transfiguration. I no longer see a sign of too much perfection, but instead signs of what we might today diagnose as obsessive compulsive disorder. He repeats images a lot, looking for perfection. He is so detailed in everything he does. He is a perfectionist to the point of being an extremist about it. Now, when my novel begins, Raphael's father is dying. And he makes the 11-year-old Raphael promise that he will become the greatest painter in all of history. And the majority of my novel focuses on Raphael's quest to keep that promise to his father by chasing, beating, and perhaps surpassing Michelangelo, as they do go head to head in the halls of the Vatican, as popes conspire and armies go to war and cardinals kill dukes and wolves rule the ruins of Renaissance Rome. But amidst all of this plot, my ultimate point is, Raphael was not as perfect as his paintings. He was just desperate to cover all over his own brokenness by creating picture after picture after picture of perfection. Determined that no matter how tough the world seemed, Raphael would never stop trying to bend the world toward beauty. So that is the version of Raphael that I found while writing this book. I have seen a couple of questions come up in the chat, so I'm gonna to start to answer them. If you have more questions, write them in the chat. Or another option is, if you have your video turned on, just wave your hands and I'll ask you to unmute and you can ask it verbally if you want to. Oh, exciting. We can actually talk on Zoom, crazy, even though I'm not there and wish I were. Okay, what did Raphael think of, of Caravaggio? Well, hold on, let me double check my art history really fast while I'm on the thing with you because I'm gonna tell you something that I don't think you know uh, since you asked the question, but I wanna make sure that I get my date right. Yes, so Caravaggio is born in 1571. Raphael dies in 1520. So Raphael dies 20 years before Caravaggio. One of the reasons why I wanna make a point of that right now, of how large of a distance that was between Raphael and Caravaggio. 
So for those of you who know Caravaggio, you know Caravaggio is known for his chiaroscuro, for the difference between light and dark in his paintings. That's what Caravaggio is, right? Well, hold on. I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to go back to a picture I've already shown you because it's worth it for this conversation, for the comparison to Caravaggio. This is where Caravaggio got his attention to chiaroscuro. It is from Raphael. It is from the bottom portion of the painting called the Transfiguration. Now, Raphael gets this from Leonardo da Vinci, no doubt. Leonardo is the one who starts playing with light and dark in, in paintings more than anybody else. So from Leonardo to Raphael to Caravaggio. Okay, uh, why do Raphael's biblical figures look like Europeans? You know, it is a sad bias of our Western history in art history. So when you look at the Western history and European art history, every European artist for hundreds of years depicted all biblical figures who you and I know in this day are obviously people from the Middle East. They obviously have darker skin than regular, than, than the European people do, particularly Northern European people and even the Italians. Um, but it is a bias of our long art history. It's in every single painting in all of um, art. They just saw themselves in the paintings. Um, it, travel wasn't as common. You would definitely have the Silk Road uh, connecting uh, Italy to uh, the Middle East at the time. So you did have some travelers running across that. Um, but just exposure to other people was not as as prevalent as it is now. And it, it, it is a sad bias. I, I keep saying that, but that's just what I keep thinking. And I certainly, when I was in our history classes as a young woman, and I am obviously as pale as anybody on the planet, you know, my family's from uh, Northern Europe, obviously. Um, but when I looked at those paintings, I was always disturbed at the images of women too right? The images of women in, in our big art history that impacts the way we see the world. We're biased. Most women were pictured as victims or as objects or something, you know, it, they, they were not pictured as fully formed human beings. And our European male artists did not depict women well, typically. They did not depict anybody who was not of white descent well at all. Uh, it is something that we are all, I think, having to contend with right now. Uh, but that's just the sad truth of the history. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Read about the history of, of art history in, in our era and, our, and, and how it has sort of built up our history. And you will find lots of more articulate people talking about this than I am. Um, the prologue didn't make him seem so human. Oh, thank you, Sharon. That was my point with the prologue, that he didn't sound like some... Um, uh, you know, old master that's, you know, when we go into museums so often, I love museums. I'm a huge museum junkie, right? But when we go into museums, we put those artists up on a physical and mental pedestal. You know, I, and, and it drives me nuts. We look at them and, and I think we think Michelangelo and Raphael had some, some divine talent that was just thunderbolted into them and they didn't have to work at it and they didn't have to struggle, and they didn't have to overcome obstacles. They didn't have to do anything like that. Um, that's the impression that I think sometimes we get when we go to museums, and it's not true. You know, that's the thing that, that, that gets me all riled up when I'm writing my own books, right? Because writing a novel is really hard, and it's really long, and it takes an enormous amount of dedication to get through, and so when I'm feeling tired and I'm feeling pulled down by it, the thing that I tell myself is I want people to look at these artists and to realize that they were human, that they were real men with real foibles and real angst and self-doubt and struggle. And their, their parents got mad at them and they got mad at their parents or they were orphaned or they or, or, or they got jealous. You know, there's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of competition between these guys. They were coming into direct contact with each other. You Can you imagine being a young Raphael, 20 something years old, showing up in Florence and the two other great artists in Florence who you have to compete with and try to beat are Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. 
okay, that's just a little bit daunting. Like, how do you do that? And that's one of the questions that I wanted uh, to answer and I wanted to deal with. Uh, the other piece of this that I really wanted to deal with Raphael's humanity, uh, since this comment uh, remarked upon his humanity, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book is I always wondered, um, since Michelangelo and Raphael were such rivals, in, in, the, hist in the, art, the long arc of history, we all see the unveiling of the Sistine ceiling, the creation and the unveiling of the Sistine ceiling as this triumphant moment for art history and art. We, it, it's gorgeous. I, I, I can only see some of you, but how many people have seen the thing in person? Oh my God, it's like you fall to the ground, right? You're like, how did a human being create that? It's the most magnificent thing I've ever seen. Now imagine how you might have felt being the young Raphael, and that's your competition. When that thing goes up, you don't look at it and go, well, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. You look at it and go, well, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. And how am I going to beat it? <gasps> oh, no, that's horrible. Okay, that was a major driving point of why I wanted to write this book, because I wanted to be in the skin of the, or oh, possibly the only person on the planet for whom the unveiling of that ceiling was a low point in their life where that was the impossible, all is lost. You might as well kill yourself because you're never getting over it. You can't beat it, what do you do? How do you, how do you go on with your life? And the amazing thing about Raphael to me is, is that ceiling is unveiled in 1513. Raphael only lives another seven years. As I said, he, he died when he was very young. Um, but when he did unveil that, he, for the next seven years, he does end up creating some of his greatest masterpieces, including uh, the cartoons for the tapestries that are going to visit you guys next year, which are which were some of the most influential pieces of art, the cartoons for that, the designs for that, influential pieces of art for the next 300 years. You know, when, when Michelangelo, so Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Raphael considered the triumvirate of the Italian Renaissance, right? The three of them together. But during Raphael's lifetime and for the next couple of hundred years, Raphael was the most famous and the most influential of the three. He was the one that other artists put up on a pedestal and strived to be like. Raphael, it was only with the arrival of the modernists, the pre-Raphaelites and the impressionists who rejected the old masters, that artists started sort of embracing the eccentricities of Leonardo da Vinci, and, and the angst of Michelangelo, you know, we, we came into our modern sensibilities and our modern sensibilities were more in line with uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo. Whereas Raphael had just given us all of our visual cliches. You know, he just set the groundwork. Like if you picture an idealized painting in your head, whether you know it or not, it probably looks a lot like a Raphael. It, if, if you're from the Western culture, if that's your background. Uh, he gave us all of that. Um, so anyway, uh, so that was my long, long, long rant on why, on why making these artists human uh, is so important to me. I do know that the CMA has a painting called Raphael and the Baker's Daughter by Ingress because I've been to the CMA uh, and I saw it and I took a picture of it on my phone and I think I social media about it. Um, but yeah, no, I did know that. I, could pr I probably should have pulled it up, but you guys, it's your museum. I'm not gonna show you a picture from your museum. Okay, were you aware of the magnificent Raphael exhibit in Rome? Okay, so here, oh, okay, so now you just brought up a heartbreaking thing for me. Thanks very much, Jeannie Spearling. Oh, you've just made me sad. No, okay, so look, I worked, so the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death was on April 6th, 2020. He died on April 6th, 1520, okay? I worked for years to make sure that this book came out on April 7th, 2020, is I wanted my book to come out in conjunction with the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death. I did not know what the world would look like on April 7th, 2020. Yeah, 
So I had a giant in-person national book tour planned where I was going to celebrate the life and death of Raphael. It was going to be in conjunction with this global celebration of this giant artist who used to be the biggest thing on the planet and now we've sort of just dismissed to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. It was going to be part of this movement. It was going to be part of, you know, I, I was sort of doing it on purpose in conjunction with that huge exhibition in Rome. There was the biggest collection of, of Raphael's work ever compiled in a single place since his death that opened in Rome. It was opened for two days before it closed for the pandemic. Now I did get to reopen with limited entry earlier this year and I had a couple of friends who got to go, but of course our passports were turned off so, and I was not going to get on an international flight. So I did not get to go. Um, I would have gone if we had been living in a normal lifetime. I went on the virtual tour. There was a virtual tour of it for a while that was, um, that was put up online and I got to tour it through that. And I had a couple of friends who went, who told me some sort of, some particular stories about how paintings were hung and how they were displayed and the stories that were told. Um, so that was nice. I had some people over in Italy sort of give me a behind the scenes look. Um, but no, the fact that everything was shut down and closed down for the pandemic um, was heartbreaking because I really thought that the 500th anniversary of his death was going to be this moment that Raphael's life and art was gonna have a resurgence in a way. Um, and and it, it did get overshadowed. Now I will say that I was really depressed about that um, with, when it all hit, cause I had to cancel, like calling and canceling a book tour that I had spent six months planning was just like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? But then I decided that at least uh, Raphael was the right guy to live through this. You know, he was so, always so optimistic and he did always make the best of everything. And he did always try to put beauty in a really difficult world. So then I decided, well, at least if I'm having to go through this awfulness with anybody, I'm having to go through it with the uh, always positive, always do it, just make the world a better place guy and artist. And so that at least made me feel a little bit better uh, about the whole canceled book tour pandemic. Not that it hasn't been great to do it virtually, but I still wish I were there. Okay, uh, what will my next book be about? Okay, Cindy, I'm gonna give you an answer, but I'm gonna disappoint you a little because I am in the middle of writing it. And I, first of all, I take a while to write books. Uh, as I said earlier, this one took me five years of actual writing. Um, I do that, I think, because I spent um, almost 20 years producing talk television out in Hollywood. So my day job, my plan B, was being a Hollywood television producer until I could become a novelist. Like, that was always what I really wanted to do. The Hollywood TV producer was just my day gig. Um, so I produced five nights a week of television, which meant I churned out content day after day after day after day after day. So I have no intention of churning out books. I don't want to. I don't want to churn one out every six months like people do or even every year. I want to take my time and explore the subjects that I really want to explore and really dive in deep and really make them as best as I am humanly capable of making them. That does not mean that I don't fall short of my own expectations, uh, much like Leonardo da Vinci, so I guess I'm in good company. Um, but, I, it, but it means I'm going to try. I'm always going to aim uh, to make it as good as I can. So I don't know when it'll be out because I'm working on it. What I can tell you is that it will still be art historical fiction because I hope to be writing art historical fiction until the day I die. Um, Michelangelo famously lived to be about 89 years old. And uh, a week before he died, he was still carving marble. Uh, I would like for that to be me. Uh, in, in regards to writing art historical fiction. Like a week before I die at 88, I still want to be like trying to, to like peck out the last novel, you know? So art historical fiction, it is not going to be uh, Italian Renaissance, however. Not that I'm done. I will be going back at some point in my career, but I need a little bit of a break. So I am going to a different art historical time period and different country, both, um, that I have also long been obsessed with and have lots of very strong opinions about. 
Um, and it's a very particular moment in another country, another time period. Uh, but, but, but what else am I saying about it? Oh, I've so told some people, although right now my social media is a little all over the place, for a while my social media, my website was really giving people strong hints as to the time period and the, uh, and the, and the, the, the sort of the art historical moment I was dealing with. Uh, so if you want to look through my social media on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or something, you might find hints or, or my website, stephaniestory.com here. I'll put that in the chat in case anybody wants it. Uh, there's lots of information there. Uh, there's, there, there, there are some strong hints floating out in the ether about what my next one's about. I'm just not quite telling you that. I can see some of you. Does in, in the last few minutes we have, does anybody Stephanie, have a, yes. Stephanie, it's Nanette, the director. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you for having me, Nanette. No, this is so exciting. I can't tell you. We enjoyed you so much with Doyle and Marvel. And when you said we could be part of your book tour, we were just thrilled. And, I, and when the Raphael Tapestries come, you must come to Columbus. We'll do a program with you. Yes, and, we'll just, and you actually will be in our auditorium and you'll see real people because the pandemic will have given us some breather by then. Yes, yes so it will. I just wanted you to know, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. My question is, it, was it your imagination or is it true? I was very taken by Raphael counting steps and turning his wrists four times. Is that a known fact or is that something you imagine because of that sort of obsessive way he worked? I'm just curious. Um, okay, so two things. I have lots of things to say about the tapestry, so I'm very much looking forward to that and I can't wait to see them. So this is all- You are definitely doing a public program with okay, us. Good. We'll fill the auditorium for you. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the OCD thing. I have gotten this question over and over and over again and I understand it, right? Okay, um, so I did write a blog about it. So if anybody's really oh, interested just, in the details <laughs> where there are links, go to my website. But I will give you the short version now. The short version is, look, obviously there was not such a thing as OCD at the time. That's a very modern disease. However, the way that I got to those ticks from Raphael, there's no indication in, in he wasn't a big, uh, he didn't write a lot of, he wrote some letters, we have a few letters. He wasn't a big poet. He didn't live long enough to write his own biography. We have a lot of very few primary sources coming from Raphael himself. So a lot of his personality has to be filled in more so than Leonardo who kept uh, ample notebooks and Raphael, I, I, I mean, and Michelangelo who wrote lots of letters, wrote lots of poetry and wrote and dictated his own autobiography. So a lot of more Raphael has to be filled in. The way I got there is when I did start spending a lot of time in his drawings. And I started to notice the number of times he would repeat things and the number of times he would, he would redraw a line trying to get it perfect. It's like, man, he is such a perfectionist. It almost looks like a disease. Like it's so, oh, and you look at his brush strokes and you're like, man, that person has a problem. Um, I love him, but he has a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, and so I started looking for um, and it's sort of feeling like OCD to me, but I was like, but I can't really give him real OCD as it presents in modern day because that's not appropriate. So I started looking at ways in which people in the time period used ritualistic behavior and counting is so common in the Catholic church, whether it's counting your rosary beads, mm -hmm. counting a flagellant whip, you know, whippings, if, if, when, when a flagellant whips himself a certain number of times, a lot of people out of guilt or shame uh, will use number counting in the Catholic church. And so I took that, I divorced it from religion because there's not a lot of indication that um, Raphael was personally, he was obviously Catholic because everybody was Catholic at the time. There's not a lot of indication um, that he was deeply spiritual like Michelangelo certainly was. Um, so he was a little bit more secular. So I did divorce it from, uh, from, the, uh, from religion but I kept that counting ritual. And then it just started growing into other things, into the very particular way he dressed himself. Everybody always remarks, his contemporary remarks, uh, contemporaries often remark about how carefully he is dressed and how careful his hair is, how meticulous everything is. So I thought, well, uh, I'll add in some meticulous dress. And then like the, the you know, the, 
the paint brushes and things that just sort of arrived naturally from, well, if this guy's as meticulous as he is, and if he does have this counting issue that he's using to express guilt and fear and trying to control an uncontrollable world, it made sense. So no, it's out of my brain, but I didn't try to do. Um, no, it's great. It, was, it really worked. And I was just curious and it was wonderful. So thank you. Well, again, I can't thank you enough. This has been, it, it is wonderful. I know you're going to answer some more questions and I just wanted to speak up and I can't wait to see you in 2022. <laughs> I'll be there. No, I'm, I, I'm very excited and I'm very excited to be back to talk to the group. Uh, Hold on, but I do have another book from, a question from Betty. I read both of your books and love them. Thank you very much. Uh, have you ever thought about writing a book about Giorgione? I have frankly thought about writing a book about every great Italian master of all time. And I am gonna have to narrow it down because I am slow. Like if I wrote a book about everybody I wanna write a book about, I would have to write a book every year for the next 40 years. And I'm just not like, it's just not how I like to write them. I like to take more time. So I'm gonna have to narrow it down. Uh, Giorgione is not out of, out of the realm of, of possibility. Um, I'm also obsessed with, I'll give you some other people I'm obsessed with in the Italian Renaissance. I won't leave the Italian Renaissance because don't wanna give away all my cards. Um, I'm obsessed with Titian because, oh man, who is, I mean, he, and I love the Venetians, the Venetians of that era with all of the water. I mean, Venice is just a magical, weird town that's frankly sinking and it's not gonna be there very long and it's horrible. Um, so I'm a little bit obsessed with um, Venice. I, of course, love Botticelli. I, I, I keep including him in, in, in these other books and mentioning him uh, because I find him, although there's been a lot done about Botticelli. So I don't, I always feel like I wanna have something new to say um, as well as, um, as well as having just like a personal interest. I always wanna feel like I'm, I'm presenting the material in a way that hasn't been presented before. And I haven't figured out a way to do Botticelli in a new way. Giorgione, no, nobody's touched. So that might be good. Thanks for reminding me. Is there anybody else who has a question who wants to wave their, here, let me scroll through and make sure I'm not missing. I don't think I'm, oh, hold on. Uh, Pat, Pat, I saw you waving. Uh, so unmute yourself. You're gonna have to unmute, Pat. Uh, there's a mute button down at the bottom somewhere or on your screen somewhere. Mute. Ah, there we go. Oh, wait, but you just muted, you unmuted yourself and then you muted yourself again. So just hit it once. I love Zoom. Okay, you got okay. it. Okay, okay. Uh, when you were um, writing, when Michelangelo and, and uh, Leonardo were drinking wine from the same skins up on the, you know, when they, when the, However, he got up there, Michelangelo. Uh, he got caught, Raphael. And they did they did you make that up? Okay, so as I was telling you during my opening speech, right? I really intended that this was going to be my Michelangelo up the Sistine scaffolding, painting that ceiling book. Yeah. When I realized that that really story had really already been told, and that the untold version mm -hmm. was through Raphael's eyes. The heartbreaker for me personally, as a writer, was that I was not going to get to go up the scaffolding with Michelangelo. That I was going to miss out on that part of the story. And so I got, I decided that somehow, sometime during, and I wasn't sure how it was gonna happen, somehow Raphael was gonna make it up the scaffolding. And so there's two points where, where there's, there's a couple points where Raphael makes one is without Michelangelo, right? He's, he's spying and he's looking and he gets up there and he's look, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers for people who haven't read it, but mm -hmm. he's up there yeah. looking at a couple of different parts up close and in person. Okay. And then this moment later where I had he and Michelangelo get to have this moment of, um, of camaraderie ship of, yeah, of, it was one of my favorite parts. That's um, why I ask about it. Thank you. It was one of my favorite parts to write. I think the initial draft was 20 pages long of that scene Ooh. because I just indulged myself and sat down and let them have a really long conversation. And then I had to edit it down to the few pages that it is. That's what made it. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank so, you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. So it's made up. But I will say that underneath it, um, I've always felt like even though um, Michelangelo externally expresses this dislike, this constant dislike of, of Raphael. You can see in his work a certain, 
uh, reluctant admiration for his younger rival um, right. that I wanted to come out in that place. It, it showed. So. We Just one quick thing, because we did uh, discuss this, everyone in my group loved the, the way uh, that Raphael narrated in such a contemporary style. Thoroughly enjoyed that. So that was incredible what you did. Well, thank you. That was nerve wracking to do because I know- I'm sure it was. It's, it's funny. fiction. It's hilariously funny sometimes. So anyway, thank you. He is, he's funnier than I am. He's a funny bloke. I am not- I don't know. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you, Pat, very much. Uh, so, since we are a little bit past two, I don't. I know oh, we yeah. started a little bit late, but I don't want to hold everybody too terribly long. Are there any other questions, though, um, uh, before before I know I have to hand it back to David at some point to do some some housekeeping? Uh, I, I just don't want to miss anybody. So let me scroll once more. I don't see anybody desperately waving a hand. You guys have been wonderful. I have thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you for listening to me ramble about one of my favorite topics, which is this guy. Oh, he's so nice. Uh, uh. Um, I hope you enjoy reading him. I hope to see you all next year for the uh, Raphael Tapestries. We will, we will all geek out over them together. I certainly will be. Okay, David. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie, for, for making Raphael human and helping us to understand so brilliantly the artist and the art of a true Renaissance genius. And we are counting on a follow-up to Nanette's and my invitation to have you return uh, to us in 2022 to talk to us while we have the uh, tapestries of Raphael in the Columbus Museum of Art. So um, thank you so very much. And um, uh, I think we have, uh, uh, Nick, if we, have, if we can get our final closing screen up for everybody to see some final announcements about the museum and what we have to offer. We've got contactless timed tickets, sanitation stations throughout the museum so that if you do visit and we encourage you to, we encourage uh, timed tickets that you can obtain in advance, but just between us, um, except for Sundays sometimes, uh, you could pretty much walk in uh, and you can uh, 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 purchase or um, you can obtain a time tickets at the admission desk. So um, don't let anything keep you away from the museum. Uh, it, it's a pleasant and safe experience that you will have. And we have happy hours on Thursdays from six to nine in the garden. Uh, you can shop in the museum store. You can dine either indoors or outdoors, especially with this warm autumn weather in our beautiful sculpture garden. You can have your meals there. Meals are snacks. And um, be sure to visit the Columbus Museum of Art website, columbusmuseum.org, to find out what's happening in terms of exhibits, programs like this, online programs, and what you might be interested in seeing at the museum. So thank you for participating in this program. This will be recorded so that if you want to tell your friends about it and or if you want to listen again, it will be online within about a week. So that's all for today. Thanks again, and I hope to see you for our next programs. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.